the occipital bone is, is, is the bone on which the whole head rests. It holds the two occipital condyles. And in direct line with the occipital condyles is the anterior border of the foramen magnum, on which is located point basion. So if we look at it this way, basion is a center for the occipital bone. The basilar portion extends upward from that. If you notice, this is a heavy bone, and it has cancellous bone in the inside with cortical bone on the outside. Here's the occipital condyle. Now, this is right here where the bone ends. In a young child, there's a sphenooccipital synchondrosis right here. Now, this is separated then by the temporal bone right here. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Temporal bone comes in and separates from the basilar portion of the occipital right here. This suture then runs backward. And all of this then is a suture with the temporal bone, which is very heavily stressed right through here. Now up here in this part of the bone is the parietal bone. Okay, got it? So this is the parietal suture. Looking from the outside, it is very heavily serrated. Now if you notice immediately lateral to the occipital bone, is the temporal bone here with the mastoid. And if you notice, this goes right down and separates at the point of entrance of the jugular foramen. Jugular foramen, right here. Okay. Now, if we go back at the back part of this bone, the point at opposite to basion is called opistheon. <coughs> when I describe this as holding up the, the brain, because the cerebellum sit right here, and the, uh, the cerebrum sits up here. Now, if you notice, there is a cross here on the inside. There is what thing? A cross. Here and here. And this is braced on the outside. Down on this part of the bone, the lower part, is attached all the muscles of the neck that hold the head up. The trapezius up through here. And all the neck muscles in here. The splenius capitis, so forth. Now, the weight of the head is mostly up front. So these muscles then are pulling down against the occipital condyle. So it's said that the head is cantilevered. Cantilever means that it's, a, it's, it's locked in the back and suspended in the front. Now, I want to discuss why we have this bone here, architecture in general. I have a given amount of material. And how am I going to modify it to get the maximum strength with the smallest amount of material? So we're going to talk about the various options that we would have, not only in nature, but in the physical world of mechanical engineering. First of all, what is that shape? It's a cup. And as Book my Buckminster Fuller, who I have an autographed copy of his book up there, Critical Paths. As he said, the geodesic dome is the strongest with the least amount of material in it that you can find. The dome with the triangle. Here's a triangle here. Here's a triangle here. See him going in? So if I'm going to have one of my options would be to cup it. Now the other one is to rib it. Another one is to make it double and put little braces in between. The little trabeculae are called little bridges. Then I can reinforce it at the places where I need to bear the greatest strength. So here you see the example of a lot of things you can do. So I can make an I-beam, a cross beam, 
I can take the T in the T beam, or I can make a column out of it, or I make a hollow tube out of it, which permits it to bend. So I have all of these options. I can make an L beam, and all of these things then that I can do to give it strength without increasing the amount of material that's in it. I have this skull here, I'll try to find. With occipitalization of the atlas, about 3% of the population has an injury or some deformity, just like that last skull I showed you had some deformity of the uh, occipital condyle on one side. So there's a lot, of, lot going on in the neck. How these stresses then come out, and just as the uh, the stresses were divided in the axis, so that in this plane of space, this is actually holding up the two temporal lobes of the brain. Now when you trace, and you trace the sphenoid, you'll see a curve that you see coming up to the side. That curve is the great wing of the sphenoid right here. Now if we just look at this bone from front to back, and from side to side, if you notice the foramen rotundum, is almost exactly in the center of the bone. There's one coming on either side. Right here, and one over here. Turn it from the back forward. And you can still see the two frame and rotundum like you see here, right through these two holes. And that's what you see in a frontal x ray. You'll see the superior orbital fissure. You'll see those two in an x ray. Now, as the forces of support come up through here, in the young in the newborn, there is a synchondrosis here of cartilage. What is the function of cartilage? A shock absorber, and it's a place that can grow under pressure. But cartilage can grow under pressure due to the fact that it has hydraulic-like action as the lacunae expand in internally. Now there's also a a synchondrosis between the two halves of the occipital condyle early. See up on television there? See it up there. Here is the synchondrosis in about age two. <coughs> That's wide open at birth, just the same as this one's wide open at birth. You see, that's right in the middle of the occipital condyle. On the front, the lateral walls of the orbit are in the sphenoid bone. On the sides, the temporal fossa. Underneath, the infratemporal fossa. On the inside, the temporal lobe of the brain. On the top, the anterior lobe of the brain. Now coming on either side is the optic chi chiasma. Now right here at the lower border of the superior orbital fissure, right below that then is foramen rotundum. But it's not really a foramen, it's a channel, or it's a, it's a, it's a tube, it's a hole. The second uh, branch of the fifth nerve goes right through there, and it comes out in front. Now right here then, on the front end of the, what I call the roots of the pterygoid plate, Right coming down from that are the two pterygoid plates. These are braces or buttresses that are holding up the maxilla via the palatine bone. So it makes sense, again teleologically, that something is really important right through here. Particularly in view of the fact that on the anterior part, there's what is called the rostrum of the sphenoid. So the rostrum of the sphenoid 
is this part of the sphenoid here, which rests the vomer bone. So think of it for a minute. Here you have an area where the great wings swing upward and outward from the body, where the two pterygoid plates swing downward, a buttress against the, the nasal septum, the vomer bone, holding the maxilla down. You have a blood supply coming in via the internal maxillary artery, going up into the orbit, down into the maxilla, and down into the palate. You have the maxillary nerve, which in general goes to the nasal capsule. So V1, or the first division, goes to the orbits. V2 goes to the nasal capsule. V3 goes to the oral. So you can think of it in those three functions. So the center one of foramen rotundum is right in the middle of all of them. So it's just not by accident that we find that that is the center of a polar phenomenon. That's very interesting how I started using PT point. Actually, I started using it in the frontal. I showed you how you could see it in the in the x-ray. By holding it up here, you can see through the two frame and rotundum. So I could see that in the frontal head film. And so we were, we, we then one day, I said, well, I wonder if I can see it on the side. So I put a piece of lead in a skull in the frame and rotundum. Everything clicked. Then we came through with our computer composites. We tried superimposing them in many ways. And finally, when I started superimposing on the the frame and rotundum, everything was lined up. So, like it or not, there it was. If you're going to use a polar phenomenon, then the only place to go was not at Sela, but down at PT point. Lay this, this part right here. Lay this on the apex of the maxilla. Right there is the pterygoid, pterygomaxillary fissure. Now I see something stopping. See, I see it stop here. <coughs> All right, right there then would be that. And right there is that bone. And right there then is PT point right there. Right there it is. So this would be the line of the pterygoid palatine area. The PT point. These are two occipital condyles, see? This is basion. All right, this is the roof of the pharynx. Those are two pterygoid plates coming down, the medial and the lateral. The lateral would be out here, the medial is right there. Now probably right here is the, is the pterygoid canal. So don't get too confused. The frontal bone, I'll turn you around like this so you see it a little bit better like to be oriented in the x-ray. On either side of the, of the frontal bone there's a platform. It's triangular in shape. And that is what receives the, from the, the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid holds up the frontal. So if I can balance that. <laughs> Got it? You take a photograph. <laughs> Okay, there it is. All right, sphenoid bone holding up the front. See it? And if you notice now, there's a hole there, isn't it? What fits up in there? The ethmoid. Did I sign the ethmoid? 
Who wants to recite on the ethmoid tomorrow? <laughs> Okay. Okay. You give the ethmoid. But it's not carrying much stress, is it? Most of the support in the cranium, then, it comes from the sphenoid bone. So now, on the frontal bone, you have two platforms here and two greater curved platforms here. These actually form the roofs of the orbit. And if you look in the, some of these open skulls, you see that there's a little ridge that comes right along on the inside of the skull, right along here. You see it's kind of smooth. で、ここ the ethmoid bone. But the ethmoid is way down here. This is a cribiform plate way down there. Now, how do we use the frontal bone then? We use it as an anterior landmark. So this point here particularly the one on the frontal bone side. Because sometimes you'll see a suture in here. And if you're going to use one point or the other, use the superior point. So that's the way we would come down and select from the I have three, three points. One which we use as mesion to represent the location of the frontal bone. PT point is the point represents a center of the sphenoid bone. で、ちょっと。で、これ、で、ジナイコツ持ってきて、歯を全部取り付けて。こういう風に組み合わせます。これは歯の足のところで切ったものです。So I've literally cut the face off, and this is a pyramid, and this is the base of the pyramid. One, two, three, four corners. One, two, three, four, with a little brace out here on the side. So pass that around, and you'll get an appreciation of the Nazion Nazion plane. Again, this is also made like a cone. Instead, if you want to look at it instead of a pyramid, then think of it as a cone. Now, if I do that then, and I cut across this cone at an angle, I have a truncation of the cone. 
if I cut that cone exactly horizontal to its base, I get a circle. But if I cut at an angle, I get an ellipse. So this cone truncated at an angle is the truncation of a cone which gives me the arch form. To me, it immensely, it immensely reduced the complication in cranial-based growth. Untreated. And I can set this patient on here at any T point. Repeat with pterygoid vertical, you said? Yeah. See, this is on 90 degrees, and this is on 90 degrees. Now, the average angle from basion on ASEAN is 27 degrees. Now, what I'm interested in is growth along these lines. On this polar phenomenon. All right, now here's the same patient. Untreated. At the age of 18 and a half. I saw this child when she was a sister of one of the other patients, and she never needed orthodontics. So later she came and applied for a job with me. And I said, before I hire you, you have to have an x ray taken. So here she is. She's one of our growth studies. And you notice here that the angle, basion nasion, the depression axis didn't change. She was 85 to begin with. And this is not too atypical for what you find in your growth patterns in, in Japan. Now, if we superimpose on basion nasion A, in her particular case, there was a slight remodeling here. With the eruption of this tube, this remodeled just a bit. But usually, we can't count on much change on basion nasion A. Where's Sala going? See? So there's one that was from age uh, 4 to age 18. It's, that's over 14 year period. But very simply, here is the behavior of Sela and the reason that we don't use it, and this is the result of composites that we've put together. So let's see if we can simplify now this whole business of growth of the calvarium. From CC to nasion, it grows 0.8 millimeters a year. In our population, now, I don't know. Okay. Now, on our original work, we found that this was growing 0.5 a year. But now, looking at much larger samples, and over longer periods of time, we think that this is growing 0.6 a year. So very simply, if you have a center point here, either from the, the Frankfurt Plain at PTV or CC point, either one, you're going to have essentially then 0.8 millimeters of growth, or 8 millimeters in 10 years. And this is carrying the maxilla with it. And this, this is growing downward and backward at a rate of 6 tenths of a millimeter a year. That the cranial base we use includes this area here for the joint. And the glenoid fossa is carried by the growth of the temporal bone. So from the pterygoid vertical, the chorion is growing backward five tenths of a millimeter a year. Carrying with it the, occipital, the, the mandibular conduct. So what is the ratio of five to eight? One to one point six. And that's almost the golden section, isn't it? So as this is growing this amount, this is growing at that pace. 
What we tried to do this afternoon was to get into the bones. This morning we talked about biology. And biologic principles. This afternoon we talk about the architecture of bones, the reasons for bones existence, and why are the bones important, because it's a frame of reference. Bone is the supporting apparatus that holds the organs of the face. It's the matrix with which we work. We can use the parts of the bone then as reference for the diagnosis and the prognosis and the treatment planning. We talked about the biologically uh, the problem in nature of harmonizing the teeth with uh, the, the bony matrix. We recognize, of course, that it is not only that, but it is a muscular matrix as well. And under that, it's a neural matrix. We then went into the individual bones, building up. The rationale and logic for the understanding of the neck bones. It's just one more point in our consideration of a total patient. In the average patient, they may not be much influence, but in aging, injury, and disease states, we have to consider the head posture and the influences of all the factors that that happen to be operative. Okay, now with that as a base, we started out talking about the vertebra and the mid sagittal calvaria. And I think we build up the idea then that the, the face really fits on that plane from basion to nasion. In fact, we call it the basocranial axis. And that being the case, we can use it as a frame of reference for the growth and development of the face. Well, you made this illustration showing from that central pole the porion, basion, the cervical vertebra, the hyoid, the orbit, nasion, uh, the posterior nasal spine, and even the chin. Tends to behave very constantly. So this is the uh, the way that we try to make it simpler and practical for our bioprogressive clinical people.